Now that you've learned all of the operators, their names, their logical functions, and what they're used to translate in propositional logic, the next big thing that we're going to learn is how to construct truth tables. We'll first do truth tables for propositions in this video, and then in another video, we'll look at truth tables for arguments. Along the way, we will learn the very specific truth functions of the logical operators or the rules that we need to use to construct truth tables. So here we're on page 335 and we're looking at truth tables for propositions. Now this is section 6.3 in your textbook and I'll also be referring to some information in section 6.2 when we talk about the truth functions of the logical operators. So let's take the very first thing. The very first thing you do when you're constructing a truth table is to determine the number of lines that you need to write. So there's a formula for that. It's L equals 2 to the n. L stands for the number of lines that you'll calculate, and n stands for the number of different simple propositions. involved. This always works in multiples. If you take a look at page 335 in your book, you can see that if you don't want to learn the formula, which I would argue is the best way to do it, that you can simply look at the number of different propositions versus the number of lines in the truth table. Because it's an exponent of two, it's always gonna be the number of lines equals two to the power of, just like in math, the number of different simple propositions involved. So if there is one simple proposition, there will be two lines in the truth table. If there are two simple propositions, there will be four lines in the truth table, and so on and so forth. But we're gonna use this formula each time we construct a truth table. The example given in your book, A, or not B implies B has already been symbolized. We'll do some practice later on how to translate these arguments from English into this standard form. If I use my formula L equals two to the N on this particular proposition, I can see that the number of lines equals two to the power of one two different propositions. So you could also say number of different simple propositions involved, but we could say number of different letters. It's another way to put it. So there are two, A and B. It doesn't matter that B is listed twice. We're not looking for how many times a letter has been used. We're looking at how many different letters there are, and here there are only two. So the number of lines in this particular truth table would be two to the second power. So it equals two times two, which is of course four. So I'm going to actually draw four lines. You don't have to take into account any empty spaces or make any other calculations. You draw four actual lines. But then we realize that Furthermore, to continue setting up our truth table for this particular proposition, what we're going to do is we're going to need to set up a number of trues and falses under each letter, not under each operator yet, but just under each letter, so that we can use our truth table for what it's for, for its purpose. And the purpose of a truth table is to take a look at the potential truth values of any particular uh, compound propositions and to determine whether or not that particular premise ha is, is valid later on when we're talking about arguments. But here, we're not looking so much for validity as we are to look for the number of different combinations that we could have. 
So the way that it's basically set up is, is that you take your number of lines and you divide it by two. Four divided by two is two. So from the first letter, from the left, and you go on from there, you're gonna put two trues and two falses. So you're always going from the first different letter from the left to the next different letter from the left, etc. So that gives us our first letter from the left. But then we're gonna divide that in half again. Two divided by two will give us our second letter from the left. Two divided by two is one. So under B, and very carefully, not under a symbol, I'm gonna put one true and one false all the way down. If you'd started off with, let's say, 16 lines, then you would have had uh, eight trues and falses all the way down, eight trues, then eight falses, um, then the next different letter from the left would have been four, etc., etc. We can, because we've already got the, tr the truth values under B, we can, however, carry them over once we've gotten the values under their first instance from the left. So we'll say B here is also true, false, true, false, true, false. Now, that is the way that we would set up this truth table for this proposition. However, what we don't have is how to apply each one of the operators. So we'll come back to this example in a moment. Each one of the operators has its own little miniature truth table that shows its truth functions. I'm going to write them a little bit differently than they're written in your book because I find it to be a little less complex. So if we're talking about negation, then we're talking about the tilde. The tilde works like this, and we just use P as a variable. In propositional logic and in symbolic logic, P's and Q's are often used like X's and Y's in math. They're just random variables. If I want to know all the potential truth values of not P, I have to start off with what all the potential values of P would be, true and false. There are only two. So because the tilde negates things, what it does truth value-wise, and in our truth tables eventually, as I'll show you, is it makes whatever P is the opposite. So if P is true, then not P will be false. If P is false, then not P will be true. If we're talking, on the other hand, about conjunction, we want to look at P and Q, but we also want to leave space for where the operator is. And here, we want to take into account all the possibilities. So I'm going to say true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So if the rule here is the opposite or negative, then with conjunction, the rule is, we can think of it this way, it's only true if they're both true, meaning whatever variable is on the left and whatever variable is on the right. So what I'm going to do in these situations is I'm going to look at these individual lines and say, I want to find my rule. I want to find where it's true, in other words, where they're both true. And the first line is the place that I can do that. The rest I know by process of elimination are going to be false. So it's only true if they're both true. Now, if we look at disjunction, We want to look at P or Q. We set it up the same way, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. But here the rule is that it's only false if they're both false. 
So again, I'm going to look at both sides. I'm only ever in a truth table or when I'm looking at truth functions of the operators, I'm only ever looking at two at one time, two columns at one time. So if I'm looking for a place where they're both false, it's the last or fourth line. I know the rest have to be true by process of elimination. So as you can see, what you're going to do is memorize the rules, not necessarily these entire tables. With implication, or with the horseshoe, we look at P implies Q. The rule is it's only false if true, then false. So if it's true on the left and false on the right. It's true and true here. Here's one, true and false. That's going to be false. And then the rest are true by process of elimination. And then the last one to look at, as far as a rule is concerned, is equivalence. So P triple bar Q. Here the rule is it's only true if both true or both false. So they have to be identical. So here they're both true, that's true, and here they're both false, that's true. They have to be identical for it to be true. The rest, by process of elimination, will be false. So you can see how each one of these operators has its rules that we use. If we go back to the example that we started off with, we would say, I want to do the tilde first because the tilde affects what's directly after it only. So the tilde B, if B is true, tilde B will be false. If B is false, it'll be true. I like to put a line through any column that I'm done with. I would then work it just like a math problem, parentheses first and then work the rest. This is the main operator, by the way, because this horseshoe here is the main operator because it affects the largest part of the problem. It affects B, but also this entire parentheses. So I want to work what's in the parentheses first. Then I want to use my rule for the wedge to look at these two columns, the one under the tilde and the one under the A. So I know that my rule for the wedge is that it's only false if they're both false. So I'm going to look for any place where they're both false. There's one here. The rest are true. I'm done with this column and this column. Um, you may want to use some other method. I, this is the way I teach it for classes because it's the easiest for me to read through when I'm grading. Um, you can also use any kind of colored pencils or uh, markers or anything that you like. And then I like to put a little double line that's not uh, any kind of standard form or anything like that. It's just a way for me to look uh, and my eyes not to forget where I am in this column. So then the last thing that I would do is compare what's under the wedge to the B column. Again, I'm only ever comparing two columns at once. That should help with some confusion. So now I'm looking with the horseshoe that it, for the rule, it's only false if it's true on the left and then false on the right, if true implies false, because that can't happen. So I've got true and true. Then here's one. I've got true, then false. That one's going to be false. False and true. Nope. True and false, yes, false. The rest will be true. I'm done with this column, I'm done with this column, and just like in a math problem, I'm gonna box my answer here. That is the answer when you're doing truth tables for longer propositions.